Hey guys, what's going on? It's Ben here. I'm back again today doing another video. The subject of today's video is going to be on the Cleveland Cavaliers. And I'm going to be doing a bit of a a bit of a hindsight 2020 analysis of the 2010 to 11 Cleveland Cavaliers and basically why they failed. So if you're unfamiliar with this time frame in Cleveland's history, let me give you a bit of background information and we can go from there. So Cleveland had LeBron James as a centerpiece of their franchise from 2003 to 2010. He left in 2010 in free agency to go to the Miami Heat. And despite them uh, like trying to get him to stay and pursuing him really hard, he still left. They had promised him ideas of like bringing in Chris Paul on trade or bringing in uh, Chris Bosh. Other tactics they tried were acquiring Shaquille O'Neal in 2009. They acquired... Uh, Antoine Jameson, who was a three-time All-Star, still relatively in his prime in 2010, uh, right before the playoff push to try and improve the Cavs and help them get further in the playoffs. But they lost in the second round in 2010 after having the best record in the NBA. And so LeBron basically was like, I think I've gone as far as I can go with Cleveland. I am going to leave. And so then the following season, Cleveland was left with this team that essentially had a lot of the same parts as they did the year before, just minus LeBron and minus a few other key players. But a lot of familiar faces were still there, and they were terrible. They went from 61 wins to 19, which was the uh, second worst in the league, and they just seemed like a team that really fell short of what people thought. I know I was included in a group of people who thought, you know, LeBron is still gone, but they still have all-star Mo Williams. They still have all-star Antoine Jameson. Both are still relatively uh, in their primes. Mo Williams was for sure, and Antoine Jameson was still in his prime, even though he was at the, towards the end of his prime. They also had good ancillary or, like, complementary pieces, such as uh, Anthony Parker, who basically, if you don't know who he is, he's like what Danny Green is now. He's just like a good for about 10 points a game, spot-up shooter. They also had Anderson Verja, who is a promising young center. Same deal with J.J. Hickson at power forward. And then good bench players like um, Armand Sessions and Daniel Gibson, Daniel Booby Gibson, who were good um Good guys off the bench, sort of like what uh, you might think of now is not exactly Lou Williams, but um, like what Isaiah Thomas is now. Just good, like, spark energy dudes who can come off the bench and be good players. Um, and so basically, I'm today going to be breaking down why they failed, why they significantly fell short. And I'm going to do that by first comparing uh, the 2019 to the 2010 team and seeing what's different and... Um, and then going from there. So first off, obviously the 2010 team had LeBron James. And that year, uh, he put up 30 points per game, 7 rebounds, 9 assists, 2 steals a game, 1 block. He took 20 shots a night, shooting over 50% from the field. He also took 5 three-pointers a game, shooting 33%. That year, Mo Williams uh, shot 44% from the field, 43% from 3, which is really good. He scored 16 points a night along with five assists, one steal a game. Uh, then you had Antoine Jameson as sort of the third piece during their playoff push. During the regular season for them, he averaged 16 points per game, eight rebounds, uh, one steal a game, half a block a game. He shot 49% from the field and 34% from three, taking 13 shots per night. And then you had Anderson Verjo as basically their sixth man, scoring nine points per game, eight rebounds, 57% from the field. Anthony Parker started all, every game of the season but one, averaging seven points per night, shooting 43% from the field and 41% from three. Uh, and then you had another guy off the bench, Delonte West, averaging nine points per night, shooting 45% from the field. And then Shaquille O'Neal was rounding out the starting lineup Oh, actually, J.J. Hickson as well. But Shaq averaged this season pretty poorly. Although he did shoot 57% from the field, he only scored 12 points per game along with 7 rebounds. And then J.J. Hickson scored 9 points per game, 5 rebounds, 55% from the field. So the starting lineup was Mo Williams, Anthony Parker, LeBron, J.J. Hickson, and Shaq with a bench of primarily Anderson Verjao, Delonte West, and Ziljunas Ilgauskas. And then Booby Gibson as well. But he was only playing around 20 minutes a night and not getting many shots. 
but he did shoot 48% from three, which is very impressive. So then looking at the playoff stats, which might make this a little more relevant to like who their actual key players are. You had LeBron playing 42 minutes a night, taking 19 shots. Uh, some pretty similar stats from everybody. But then you saw the lineup shorten a little bit in that um, you had Mo Williams, instead of playing like 30 minutes a night, he was playing 37. LeBron, instead of playing like 38 minutes a night, he's playing 42. Uh, Jameson is playing 34 instead of 30. Anthony Parker's playing 30 instead of 28. Delonte West is up from 21 to about 25. Anderson Jabberjo is playing a little bit more. Shaq is playing about the same amount. But Shaq is the guy who really was the difference for this team in them not being able to get over the hump, in my opinion. He was supposed to be the second option on this team, and the year before in Phoenix, he put up 19-9. and nine. And this year in the playoffs, he put up 11 points a game and 5 rebounds, which is really underwhelming. And he shot only 51% from the field in the playoffs, which is also underwhelming. LeBron actually played really well in the playoffs, 29, 9 rebounds, 8 assists, 2 steals, 2 blocks per game, shooting 50% from the field on 19 shots per game, and on 5 threes per game, he shot 40% from 3-point land, so that's very impressive. Uh, but yeah, that's just a flavor for their regular season statistics, or uh, excuse me, playoff statistics. Uh, as for their advanced numbers uh, for the regular season, so the, the things I want to really look at here are uh, win shares, which are an indication of a, an estimation of how many wins a player contributes to a team's total. So here you have LeBron with about 18 to 19 at eight, at 18.5. So right there, if you take that off, if you take him off the team, the Cavs are expected to win the next season only around 43 games if everyone else stays. But then you have Delonte West leaves, and that's three. So now they're down to 40 expected wins. Then you have Anderson Verjao leave. That's another two, so that's down to 38. Then you have Shaq leave. That's another three, so you're down to 35. Um, and actually with those sort of .5 numbers in there, it's actually 34. So going into 2010 to 11, the core of the team... After uh, Shaq had left, LeBron had left, Zildjian Sogauskas had left, and um, just with the guys that they had left, the the core was looking like Antoine Jameson and Mo Williams as like the leaders of the team, with Anderson Verjao, Anthony Parker, and um, a mix of guys sort of rounding out the bench. But really, Antoine Jameson playing a lot of small forward actually this season, so they actually had J.J. Hickson starting a lot too. So your essential starting lineup for this year is Mo Williams, Anthony Parker, Antoine Jameson, J.J. Hickson, and Anderson Verichau. And so this team, as we say, it's expected that they're going to be about a 34-35 to 35 win team just based on this record and the amount of win shares that they lost. But... For a few different reasons, this team did very badly. So Mo Williams missed about 15 games for this team during the time he was there. He was traded at the trade deadline to the Clippers in exchange for um, Baron Davis. And the, the, the draft pick that the Cleveland actually got back was ended up being the number one pick, which they used to get Kyrie Irving. But they basically traded, uh, the Clippers traded Baron Davis and future number one overall pick to Cleveland in exchange for Mo Williams. So when Baron Davis came back, he essentially replaced what Mo Williams was doing. Uh, he Baron Davis gave him 14 points per night on 42% from the field and 41% from three, uh, shooting six threes per game. Whereas Mo Williams, who's expected to jump up and be a much bigger contributor on this team than he was, this season for Cleveland, he averaged 13 points per game, 7 assists a game. He shot 39% from the field, which is putrid, and 27% from 3, which is what his specialty is supposed to be. So he all around basically just had his worst season of his career. Uh, Antoine Jameson was supposed to be basically the guy on this team, and he basically was. He, he scored 18 points per night. He had 16 shots per game, which he shot 43% from the field on. He took five threes a game, and he shot 35% from three. So again, 18 and 7 were his averages, along with one steal per night. Then rounding out the starting lineup, you had Anthony Parker, who basically put up the exact same numbers as the year before. Eight points per night, 40% from the field, 38% from three, so a little bit lower on those, but still good. 
Um, Anderson Verjao put up nine and ten, nine re- nine points per night, ten rebounds, fifty three percent from the field, so about what you'd expect. And JJ Hickson put up um, fourteen points per night, along with nine rebounds, shooting forty six percent from the field. And then their main guys off the bench, Daniel Gibson put up twelve points per night. Still shooting on good splits, over 40% from three-point land. And then Ramon Sessions did well as a sort of a six-man or spot starter. He scored 13 points per night on 47% from the field and 10 shots per night. So the team still had what you consider good, good pieces, but then when you consider Baron Davis missed a lot of time when they acquired him. Mo Williams missed about 15 games when they had him initially. Uh... D- Antoine Jameson missed 25 games. Anderson Vergeau missed 51 games. Um, Daniel Gibson missed 15. They really just didn't have many dudes who were healthy the whole season. The only guys who basically played the whole season were J.J. Hickson and Anthony Parker, who, although decent role players, obviously not the guys that you want being the best guys on your team playing every night. The advanced stats are crazy in that... um, if you look at win shares, that they just plummeted for everybody on the team. J.J. Hickson went from four per game the previous season down to one. Uh, Ramon Sessions was a highlight here at four per game. He actually led the team. Uh, Anthony Parker went from the season before being um, five, five win shares. He went down to one. Uh, Daniel Gibson had two, and that was, uh, let's see here, the same from the season before. Anderson Verjao had two, and that was down from the season before when he was at eight. Um, let's see here. Mo Williams. Mo Williams was crazy. He was at negative 0.1 win shares, and the season before he had seven win shares, which is crazy. So they're actually saying that him playing at all for Cleveland hurt them more than if he just would have not played for the team, they would have been better off. Um, Antoine Jameson was probably the, the – he had three – and the season before, because he had barely played for them, he only had two. So he actually, uh, it looks like he played better, but he actually underachieved in that he played like double the games for them and only had one more win share, which isn't great. Um, yeah, so nobody really did well in this sense besides Ramon Sessions, who actually had the best on the team. Uh, box score plus minus, everybody was negative, so nobody did really well except for Verjao, who had a point eight positive. Uh, box score plus minus and that was only on the defensive end he was a negative 1.2 on offense so basically the team did a lot worse obviously Um, but I think if you're going to attribute why this team actually failed I think it's because of two reasons primarily or three let's put in three number one the obvious one they lost a few really good players, especially one amazing player. So you lose LeBron James, that's losing the best player in the game at that point. You also lose some really good role players in, uh, you lost Delonte West, you lost Shaq, you lost Ildrunas Ogowskis. Those three guys were three really good supporting, supporting cast members. And so between those three and LeBron, you're losing, let's see here, 42 plus, uh, 16 that's 58 points per game that you have to you have to compensate with with other players and so that and that naturally leads to a lot of other players who didn't get as much shine previously becoming much more important the next season and so you're expecting Antoine Jameson to be an all-star caliber player uh you're expecting Mo Williams to be the all-star player he was you're expecting Anderson Verjao to take over and be a quality starting center You're expecting Daniel Gibson to basically fill in for um, Delonte West and also provide what he was providing before. You're expecting Anthony Parker to basically be the same. You're expecting J.J. Hickson to pick up a lot of the slack, and we saw that. So if we look from the previous season, uh, Mo Williams took more shots per game. He took 13 compared to 12. J.J. Hickson took 12 shots per night compared to six previously, so he his uh, his shots per game doubled. Uh, Antoine Jameson took 16 shots per night as compared to 13. Anderson Verjao took uh, seven shots per night compared to six. Uh, Anthony Parker, instead of six shots per night, he was taking 
uh, eight. And let's see here. Daniel Gibson, instead of five shots per night, Daniel Gibson was taking 10. And then obviously Ramon Session is 10 shots per night, and he was a new addition, sort of their big get in free agency. Uh, and so as you can see, you're basically expecting they, – they were expecting – Ramon Sessions, J.J. Hickson, and um, Daniel Gibson to essentially replace the other guys that they lost in LeBron, Shaq, Ilgauskas, and Delonte West. And that's just not really fair to ask of them unless you're expecting Antoine Jameson to be putting up 24 points per night, which is he was basically past that point in his career at this time, or Mo Williams to put up 20 points per night. Who, what? That's something he had never really even done before, so you can't really expect that of him. But... Um, another big reason here is the injuries, as I highlighted earlier. You're expecting these guys, especially when Mo Williams and Antoine Jameson are missing time, you're basically expecting Ramon Sessions and Daniel Gibson to be, and along with J.J. Hickson, you're expecting that trio to win you games. It's just unrealistic. Uh, so I think it's pretty logical why Cleveland did bad, but I think the reason why they didn't get the 34 wins, which is what they were projected at, and instead fell 15 wins short at 19, was basically because of injuries. I think that's the biggest factor. Um, but if we look, I'd say this is by far Daniel Gibson's best year of his career. Although his field goal percentage is lower, dropping from 47 to 40, his three-point percentage is still high at, four, at over 40%. And then also he sets a career high in points at 12 per game. Uh, so this was actually a really good year for Daniel Gibson. So if there's any Booby Gibson fans out there, this was his season in Cleveland. Um, that's all I got for today. I, this was just a really interesting topic that I wanted to look into because I always was curious why Cleveland did so much worse in this follow-up season when they were expected to at least be in the mid to high 30s for wins. Um, that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope you have a good day. Leave any comments below if you have any, and I'll see you next time. Bye.